Greetings, my dear friends. In today's episode of Paryavarana or Guru Pali, we have with us Dr. R. Suresh Kumar. Dr. Suresh is a scientist at Wildlife Institute of India, WIR, Dehradun, with the Department of Endangered Species Management. He is a trained biologist and specializes in animal ecology, migration and movement studies, and conservation biology. In his research career of over 15 years, he has studied variety of endangered species and habitats throughout India. He was a part of 29th Indian Scientific Expedition to Antarctica in 2009, where he conducted aerial surveys of marine mammals and birds. He joined WIR as a faculty in 2008 and has been involved in teaching and training assignments since then. He is a great teacher and a storyteller. I happen to be a part of course on wildlife conservation for wildlife enthusiasts conducted by WIR, where I got a chance to learn from and spend time on FIT with Suresh. He has always been very encouraging and appreciative. Let's go ahead and talk to him about his views on wildlife conservation. Hello Suresh sir. Hello Seema. Namaste. Namaskar. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Yeah, at this point of time, we are supposed to be doing this. Yes, Namaste and yes, Namaskar. this is better. <laughs> yes, and it feels okay. so Indian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Suresh, sir, um, at WIR campus, you have designed some experiments, very short experiments, in which uh, you monitor the populations of certain species or uh, uh, get some observations regarding the natural history of uh, these uh, species uh, in the WIR campus itself. So uh, interestingly, these experiments, uh, they do not need any funding and uh, the observations are voluntarily carried out by the faculty as well as your students and all of you are so enthusiastic. So please tell us um, some something about it. So uh, if, if I have to tell you something about it, it's, it's about uh, something like it's a personal choice, you know, something like this, anybody could uh, do it, you know, anywhere. Uh, the story behind this whole thing is that, uh, yes, we all have our own dedicated projects and uh, we go out and carry out these projects and all of these projects are time bound and there is some funding and then the funding is over and then we wind up and all of these stories. So very often what we feel is that we are not able to really understand these species, understanding nature, you know, it's a, it's a long term thing. You cannot, it's not like, okay, you go and do a study for two years and you collected some data, we start questioning that information that is generated, okay? So in the sense that this is very uh, population specific or time, you know, it is that particular point of time. So often there is this general feeling amongst us, uh, many of us that, you know, uh, we should have these long programs of uh, certain species. So this particular idea, uh, it was not conceived as a long-term monitoring activity in the initial. It was just as an idea, just to, you know, some of us used to walk around the campus. We have a very beautiful campus, you've seen that, and uh, uh, we have a small wilderness area within the campus. So it's now like a refuge, it's like an island. There's a lot of habitations all around. But thankfully, mm -hmm. the species that survive uh, in these habitats uh, continue to be there. So we used to uh, just walk around, make observations, and then it became more a little bit more systematic. And then uh, it started taking shape of a formal uh, approach where uh, we, we sensed that, okay, so if you're making these observations and if you're recording this regularly, why not do it in a little bit more systematic uh, fashion? So, mm -hmm. and uh, today I'm glad to say that uh, we've been monitoring at least this population of turtles. We have a species of turtle on campus known as the tricarinate hill turtle. And uh, it, it is an associate of the sal forest. So if you know that Deradun is primarily dominated by sal forest, the hardwood tree sal, Choria robusta. So this is an associate of that. So wherever there are sal forests, you have this particular species. So when I initially started reading about this, getting to know about the species, I sensed that there's hardly any information on it. But uh, it is listed under the Schedule 1 of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act. So there is a lot of species listed up there. And you, as you may very well know, much of uh, most of these species we hardly know anything about. So I sensed that, uh, uh, you know, we should collect data, collect, understand the species, you know. 
So thankfully, somehow it uh, got in, uh, into a very formal, or not in formal in, in that sense, in the true sense, but we've managed to collect data systematically over the last 20 years, and we continue to collect data. In fact, as we speak, uh, just a week back, uh, we found uh, two turtles moving around, and some of these turtles were tagged or marked more than uh, 15 years ago. So we are able to understand the understand. Uh, uh, in, I mean, uh, uh, collect data on you know how long do these species survive? These are the small little things that uh, you would like to know, which you otherwise will not be able to get this information in a two-year or a three-year study. So. That is an established uh, uh, long-term monitoring program. And uh, I think this is one such program anywhere in the world where we have managed to collect data about the species. Almost all aspects of this particular species we've been able to understand. So it all, uh, you know, it, it, so coming back to this thing that, you know, you initiated this program, you don't need funds. And so, yes, there are so many such things that is there right in our backyard you know if you want to do wildlife research or you want to collect data not necessary that we have to go to some protected area only right in our backyard in your lawn in your garden you know how do your plants are doing how when is the flowering season your your tree watch program you know so it can be easily done and it can be done just by anybody you don't need to be a specialist or an expert on that and uh, nature it's, it's Okay, it requires some amount of, uh, I would not just simply say interest, you need to have some passion. Okay, that's very important. So you need to be passionate about uh, what you're doing. And once you have that, I think uh, things will fall in place. So you really don't need uh, lots of money to understand how nature works in your backyard. And believe me, when I say this, that information is really, really critical. It is not about how nature is... Uh, working or you know is uh, in, in, in operation in a protected area in a in a very scenic wilderness uh, habitat or something like that right in our backyard mm -hmm. so uh, slowly we have now moved on uh, got some more students interested uh, because i family don't have so much time now so i'm getting students interested and uh, in fact uh, we all live in a gated community in the wildlife institute we have started the a nest monitoring program so we have started putting up nest boxes in uh, the entire campus and have actually got in got the faculty and their families involved in monitoring the nest boxes so you know you are able to collect data by involving what we call citizen scientists so all of us are citizen scientists in in many ways so, you know, I keep getting uh, calls or uh, there is a WhatsApp group dedicated for that, which is the easiest, as you know. Uh, uh, you know, the kids uh, saying that I have uh, created uh, coming and exploring the nest box. So it's not just about collecting data. It's about getting people involved. That's more important. And in the long run, when you visualize something like for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you want to actually look at the patterns in say uh, nesting periodicity you know has the, is there a change in that is there a response to uh, climatic events or weather patterns you know erratic weather patterns that we often notice you need data sets which are in the, primarily in the long term so the nest monitoring program has been quite interesting and has also been giving us some really really giving us real uh, good insights and again you know for such programs we don't really need to look at some really charismatic species you know we have to I, I, I was, yeah, I'm actually uh, coming to this because um, okay. uh, mostly what I what we see is the um, the college students, hmm? uh, uh, especially those who are uh, doing their uh, degrees in like BSc and MSc. Uh, so they are mostly interested in these chari charismatic species, huh? as you said, or flagship species. So whereas you uh, you were always more interested in uh, studying lesser known and uh, uh, threatened fauna. So based on your research experience over uh, this last uh, 15, 20 years, what uh, advice would you give to uh, our students regarding this? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And it's a very important question, I would say, especially uh, if there are youngsters in your group who are listening to what, I, what I'm speaking. 
So I'm just going to talk about myself, right? So the question is first about why I chose that. Maybe this will help some people. See, the if you look at the wildlife researcher community in India, it's still a very, very small group when you compare with many other countries. A very small group of people who are actually doing wildlife research. Now, <clears throat> but there is a lot of competition. Believe me when I say this, there is a lot of competition. And competition in the sense that uh, uh, it's, it's basically about very limited amount of funding that is available. And most of this funding that is available is primarily for charismatic species or flagship species, which do deserve the kind of attention that they require. They do deserve that. So you have a very established, uh, I wouldn't say very established, but you do have a good number of researchers who spend a long amount of time in trying to understand these species. So if you are a newcomer and you want to join in, you need to be really, really be smart enough to cover a niche for yourself, you know. So even for uh, you would you would always want to say that I'm doing something so there is some someone is able to notice, okay, so this guy is looking at lesser known and threatened species. So, and I had also had this inner feeling that, you know, why is that people are not studying these species? They might not be as charismatic as uh, a tiger, you know? I don't want to blame the tiger, but, <laughs> but so, so like the tiger or for, for that matter, you know, the red panda. Okay. It's so poorly studied again, but it's a charismatic species. And uh, so there are a whole number of species like that, which are charismatic. They're very attractive, no doubt. They're cute and they're very pretty and they live in such nice uh, landscapes and all that. But there are these less charismatic species, which are actually telling us much bigger stories. So if you are someone who's really interested in understanding how nature works, it, you need to actually understand it through the eyes of these uh, less charismatic species, I would say. So coming back to my own experiences, so in my initial years, I started uh, identifying myself uh, as someone who's interested in lesser known and threatened species, because there was some amount of funding for that. You know? So for example, if I would say that I'm going to go uh, do a survey in Arunachal Pradesh in Eastern Himalayas, so at that point of time, 20 years back, there was no information coming about many of the species up there. So there was always some, some small amount of funding. It's not very large amount of money. It's small amount of money available to go and do a survey. So gradually, gradually over time, I sensed that uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge whether you're working on charismatic species or, or a lesser known or not that charismatic species. It's still a challenge with respect to funding. But um, it's far more satisfying for me personally to say that, you know, okay, if someone is going to go and uh, do a review about this particular species, you know, there is that particular information that I have gathered is going to be part of the history. It's going to be there, the recorded history that it is there. And more, more than that, we are talking about management of species. When you don't know anything about it, how are we going to manage these species? So your contribution is going to be valued very, very much. And so it's very important for youngsters who are keen or interested in coming into this field, it's very important for them to understand that they have to have their own niche. So you have to have your own niche. Even if you're saying that you're interested in plants, that's not enough. You really need to understand what aspects of the plants or what species groups uh, amongst plants is very important. So orchids amongst plants are extensively are being studied very, very well. And there are established experts and there's a lot of research and people are fascinated with orchids. But is it about just going and looking for or orchids or Western guards or uh, Eastern guards or you know Northeast India? It's not that. You know? So I'm not saying it, you shouldn't do it. But what I'm saying is that you need to gauge for yourself where is that or which is that area that would uh, help you establish yourself? So I would say that uh, I, I don't know, Seema. Just to be honest, I don't know for sure whether I've made the right choices or right decisions. I think I just followed my heart. 
you know, I just enjoy that looking at uh, small, small things. And, and it's also that when I came into this field, I didn't come as a, someone who's really crazy someone crazy about birds or so birds is my uh, is I wouldn't say my niche area I would say more my comfort zone this is because you have some knowledge with birds and you want to you know figure out somewhere in the crowd but uh, <clears throat> I would say that I was more a naturalist and that's extremely important when you're starting your career uh, appreciate everything that you see around right from plants to you know to spiders, to insects, to birds. And so I think that helped me, you know? So I, I guess I, I have answered more than yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. So go, uh, uh, regarding your early research, so your doctoral research was uh, uh, on this olive ridley uh, turtles, their offshore distribution and movements and migration. And, um, so uh, currently also WAI is doing uh, some study regarding this all related to us, but it is, uh, it is from the west coast of India, while you studied um, it uh, on the east coast of India. So um, uh, can you throw some light uh, on what are the differences and what are the similarities yeah. of the species? I think, or yeah. yeah, I think uh, your, your western India, Mumbai audience are going to be quite uh, interested yes. in hearing this yes. story, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess many of them know about the olive ridley sea turtles uh, in, in the uh, Indian uh, ocean waters. I'm not saying Indian ocean waters, but in the Arabian Sea as well as the Bay of Bengal and in the Indian Ocean. So, and yes, so when we talk about olive ridleys in India, it's straight away the, the story goes to Orissa. Uh, because that's where uh, the olive ridleys come and nest in such large numbers. And uh, also that that particular, uh, you know, site or the region has been witnessing lots of turtle mortalities. Turtle mortalities are happening everywhere. Okay, turtles will continue to die. Even as I speak, turtles must be dying out there because of extensive fishing that's going on. The project that I was involved in, which was from my PhD, we, we tried to understand uh, where are these turtles coming from? You know, the basic, the basic question is that you see them in the Orissa waters, but you don't see them throughout the year. So they're coming from somewhere. So before we started our study, uh, there were stories about turtles coming from Australia, coming from uh, Philippines, coming from Malaysia, and, and there were a lot of such stories. They can come because the ocean environment is, is open. It's an open scape. You know, they can go anywhere and everywhere. So unless until we do a tracking study, we would never know. So when we actually did this tracking study, which is one of the biggest tracking projects in the world, I would say, because we tagged in a span of two years, we tagged close to 65 turtles uh, in the Odisha coast alone. And that's a very large number of turtles. You know, in terms of a PhD data, it's like volumes of data. And in terms of understanding the species also, we're able to capture the variability in the population as to where all they go. But very, very interestingly, what we found is that all of these turtles, possibly that come to the Odisha coast, remain to the Bay of Bengal. Okay. And there was also the other outcomes of this study. That is, when we were witnessing turtles nesting along the Odisha coast, you're also having turtles nesting along the Maharashtra coast, Ratnagiri, Sindhudur, at the same time. And you're also having turtles nesting in Sri Lanka. So when I look at my tracking data, so when the turtles, if whatever turtles that you have in the Bay of Bengal, they're all moving up to the Odisha coast to nest there, there are some populations still nesting in Sri Lanka. How is it that the Sri Lankan populations are not moving up? Or why is it that they're not coming in and joining with the Aribada nesters, you know, this mass nesting population in Odisha? Similarly, the question will go to the Maharashtra coastline. Why is it that they're all same species? But that's when we, we, we realize that these possibly could be different populations. Okay. So when you and each of these populations, Sima, it's so, it's so beautiful when you look at these data, each of them displace one another on a temporal scale. So when you have the olive ridleys from the Odisha coast, Going, go, going down to the Sri Lankan coast, 
that sometime in the month of july august during the monsoon when they are down there at that time the sri lankan turtles are not there okay so in fact to understand this we went and tagged one one olive ridley turtle in the sri lankan coastline southeast sri of sri lanka around the same time okay. february march and there was this population nesting up there in odisha and we found that or when all of these turtles are moving down the orissa turtles are moving down to the bay of bengal close to the indian ocean and the bay of bengal where these two waters meet we see that the sri lankan turtle is moving up along the west coast of india and had, and in fact that particular put up all the way towards goa and uh, karnataka goa and maharashtra coastline so so what i'm trying to say is that we are possibly dealing with three or four different populations so when the sri lankan turtles are moving up to the orissa coastline then all of these turtles that are nesting here in maharashtra they would be moving off somewhere else in the arabian sea okay so now this is one of uh, one of the areas that we were really interested in understanding that there are possibly different populations and what is also very important is It's a population, it's a mass nesting population, and the olive ridleys are very, very unique or interesting in the sense that they have this uh, reproductive behavioral polymorphism that we say, which means there are populations that nest as a large colony. You know, also individuals within these populations are individuals, regardless of this group, that are nesting solitarily. so the question also comes up as to why are these populations nesting solitarily whereas those populations have evolved to mass nest so what it when you look at uh, the maharashtra coastline this coastline or for that matter the whole of the western part of india or anywhere else along the in, along the indian coastline these unique individuals that come and nest solitarily are also very very important and if you look at the scale of nest uh, depredation that is happening due to feral dogs that's there all along the coast line 95% 99% of these nests are being lost so so having said that there are these challenges and of course there is also this mortality that is happening that's also there now having said all that but it's still uh, a mystery so we don't know yet the project that we have conceived the it is in it is in it is in plan uh, as to where are these turtles coming from they could be coming from the somalian coastline they could be coming from the persian gulf they could be going down all the way down to south africa to we don't know so unless until we put some tracking units on these turtles similar to the odisha odisha uh, coastline uh, we would not know so yes so still a mystery we don't know that story you know so that that's the whole idea and there is also this other important aspect of this project that is if you see the orissa coastline the five okay so they arrive much in time and they congregate in those near shore waters before they actually go in for mass nesting so the nesting period there is for about four months i would say at least so end from november end all the way into april and april they all start to leave so when they are there in the near shore waters that is when they become highly susceptible to fishing because the fishing intensity is very high in close to the coastline or the shoreline so you have similar situations even here along the west coast and i am not sure whether these solitary nesting turtles that come along the maharashtra coastline that do visit here do they reside in these near shore waters or do they just come nest and leave immediately to the oceanic waters it, the the thing is it's highly possible okay it's very highly possible that this is the scenario but there may be hot spots uh, you know for turtle hot spots i would call it along the coastline ratnagiri sindhudurg particularly along this area even up along the mumbai coastline but there's a lot of disturbance okay? so we need to identify these hot spots which is very important and again this is important from the management perspective because how do you expect managers to protect uh, these areas or protect sea turtles if you don't know where these hot spots are and possibly there is fishing so you need to manage the fisheries also you need to work with the communities manage these fisheries also so yeah so that's what this project uh, is uh, you know is is plan we we plan to do in this project 
So hopefully, very interesting, we, Suresh. Sir. Hopefully, we should get some funds very quickly and maybe start this work and involve local communities. That's very important. Fisher, Fisher yes. That's very important. So I'm coming to that local communities working with local communities uh, when uh, you are into conservation. So uh, uh, one of your projects uh, also involves uh, it is about Amur falcons. Hmm? Yeah. In, uh, yes. 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 Yeah, so so can you shed ready. some light? Yeah. Hmm. Yes. So Mumbaiers, be ready. I would say because uh, <laughs> the birds that we've been tracking, uh, uh, the Amur falcons that we've been tracking. I'm sure every, many people must be knowing about this yeah. this unique bird that comes to India. It's a passage migrant. It comes from Mongolia and goes down to South Africa. And we started off this project in Nagaland in 2013 in extremely difficult, hostile situations. Because uh, Nagaland, uh, prior to starting off this work, Nagaland was a very, I mean, it has been a very difficult place. And so many other issues. And also hunting has been one of the biggest issues, not only in Nagaland, the whole of Northeast. It is a big challenge the challenge. So in a situation like this, how do you go and convince people to stop hunting uh, birds? And they were hunting Amur falcons, you know. So, so that has, uh, I mean, I wouldn't delve too much into that at this point of time, but this is one of those projects, you know, it's a very, very satisfying piece of work. Uh, it feels good, primarily because the local communities have, are responsible for the change that is there. So, it is about tracking Amur falcons. It's about understanding where these birds uh, go uh, or how do they migrate through India and which are their stopover sites in Northeast India and particularly in Nagaland. All of these things are, are uh, the, the stories that we were finally looking for. But most importantly, it was the information was primarily required for communicating it to the local people saying that, see, these birds are special. So it's it's very easy for us to go and tell people that you know these birds come from Siberia. I mean, even I don't know where exactly Siberia is. Okay, Siberia is up there, and you need to connect them geographically. And what do you do in in the in remote places like Nagaland, where the local hunter would not know any any place beyond his village or beyond that mountain ridge? He knows that the birds come every time, or it's a seasonal appearance of these birds. They're coming from far and all that. But you cannot. Uh, tell him or you cannot connect him to the geography. So this project actually filled in that gap. You could show it on a map, you can tell him. So in fact, that was one of the very important, uh, you know, change that we could, so it's, it's information shared with local people and people are able to connect themselves, you know, hey, this is coming from China, I mean, China, this is coming from Siberia, this is going to South Africa. So in fact, many of the local people are monitoring these birds themselves. They in fact call me and tell me the bird is, is, is returning back to Nagaland, are you coming? So yeah, so, so, uh, so that's interesting. And I was also telling that uh, Mumbai cars be ready simply because there are these uh, uh, four Amur falcons that are currently active that we had tagged, a uh, few of them are active, I mean that we had tagged last year in Manipur are actually on the return migration from uh, South Africa. So they're right now in Somalia. They're waiting for the right wind conditions. So Mumbaikers, if you put out your face out in your balcony and if there's going to be a strong breeze coming from the west, that means the Amurs are coming. They're going to be making this uh, oceanic crossing. Okay, unbelievable oceanic crossing that they will be doing three days nonstop flight before they make landfall along the Gujarat coastline and bird which is called long leg <clears throat> and this bird has been active since 2016 November 2016 so it's it's kind of a record time that we've been monitoring this bird and uh, it is still active and it is waiting there in Somalia to leave and this particular individual is also very interesting because unlike all the other Amurs that we have been tracking most of them will make landfall in Gujarat and then move up into the Gangetic Plains and then back to Northeast and head off uh, towards China. But this particular individual, every it from the Gujarat coastline, it actually makes a uh, headway straight to Mumbai, okay? So it comes down to Mumbai. In fact, one of the times it just flew very close to Mumbai and then from Mumbai, it will go down south. So I'm actually excitedly waiting to see whether this bird is going to do the same. So for the last three years that it has done that. 
So it has, it makes, uh, it probably just flies over Mumbai. So we'll have to wait and watch. So yeah. that's why I'm saying, uh, all be ready. And I'm sure Seema, you can share with your group the information about the movements of these birds. Yeah. Sure. This is very interesting and very inspiring also. Uh, Asha, uh, so one of the uh, like uh, things you have been to Antarctica hmm, as a part of the 29th uh, Indian Scientific Expedition. So we would like to hear some, some of your experiences during this expedition. Yeah, so I, I would just uh, consider myself very, very, very fortunate and very, very lucky to have got an opportunity, a sponsored trip, you know, <laughs> a sponsored trip to Antarctica. Yeah, I was part of the uh, uh, scientific uh, expedition, uh, and uh, it it is definitely one of the uh, uh, lifetime opportunities that I've got. And uh, I don't know whether I will be able to go back once again there, but uh, yes, so it was a very very uh, interesting experience, I would say. And I told you, Seema, that I'm more a naturalist, you know. So uh, I love geography. I mean, anybody interested in nature should should know geography. You know, you should be able to connect to places. That's very important. So uh, I also teach my students here biogeography. You know? So when we talk about landscapes, for me, Antarctica is one of those landscapes, you know, because the all of the landmasses that we see today, they were all at one point of time, Antarctica and we were all the you know it goes back to the geologic times so when I was uh, asked to join on this trip it was literally going back in geological time so you know going back and seeing these landscapes and I had seen uh, uh, a lot of documentaries about uh, you know uh, Antarctica and such a unique landscape so yes so the story about my trip. Uh, first of all, uh, it was also a test on my mental ability. Okay, so it's not Antarctica. That's for sure. Okay, of course, it's easier if you want to go as a tourist. But if you want to be part of the scientific uh, expedition, uh, mm -hmm. as part of the Indian scientific expedition or any other scientific expedition, it's difficult. So. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, is a requirement is uh, uh, your mental state. So you need to clear that uh, test uh, at Ames, Delhi. Okay, that's where I had to go. I wasn't sure. I could. I, I, I didn't know whether I'm mentally ready for Antarctica. But so I went and this uh, doctor interviewed me and she said, uh, you're normal. I said, okay. <laughs> I'm normal. I'm ready to go. I just pack my bags and then... We were put on a flight from uh, Mumbai. We went down to Cape Town and we had our chartered ship. We don't have a research vessel of our own. And I believe that uh, there's one currently in the process of being made. So our research vessel is from Russia uh, and the research vessel was there in Cape Town. So we boarded the ship in Cape Town and uh, all of a sudden we are sailing. After some two, three days, we are sailing and I Till then, till that moment, I couldn't, uh, you know, I mean, I couldn't sense it, you know, feel it, that you're actually going off to Antarctica, you know. And then, uh, you know, we are sailing through the, uh, through the Indian Ocean waters, and I was able to connect to all of the stories that I was telling my students about these, these landscapes, these oceanscapes. And so the, 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 the journey, uh, voyage from Cape Town, we first went to one particular site known as Last, and that's where our third or second functional uh, India, and that's called Bharti. The first one was Dakshin Gangotri, and the Dakshin Gangotri was abandoned, and then subsequently the Maitri station was built, and the Maitri station is functional. It's a very large station, and it's that particular station is actually located on the Antarctic continent, straight line distance from Cape Town. Okay, it's a straight line if you draw a straight line. Okay, but the Maitri station, uh, sorry, the Bharti station, which is located in eastern Antarctica, is actually straight line from Kanyakumari. Okay, 
And uh, so my expedition, we were actually going there to lay the foundation work. There was no stage. So we were part of the scientific community, uh, scientific expedition. There were other people also along with us who were uh, doing this. And so to cut it short, because it's a very long story, to cut it short, uh, my role in, the, in Antarctica was primarily, we have a project which is again looking at long of uh, Antarctic pack ice seals. So there are these seals that uh, are exclusive to Antarctic and they live on the pack ice. Okay, the pack ice means or the, the sea uh, ice, which you know, uh, is basically floating ice over the ocean. So these seals have evolved to survive on this pack ice. Yeah, so the timing of uh, the expedition coincides with southern summer. That is, Antarctica has summer during that period, which is from November all the way till about March. Okay, so during this period, there is 24 hours sunlight. So the first thing that we had to cope with and your entire biological clock, so it's a challenge. That's a, that's a, and a lot of people uh, are, 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 do have face problems because of this and they mentally become quite unstable. And it's even more difficult during winter when there is complete darkness for 24 hours and for months together. So my expedition was primarily the summer period and that's when the wildlife is at its peak activity or reproductive state. So we uh, were monitoring the uh, populations of seals there or we have started a program to monitor and subsequently there, has, there have been a few other expeditions, few other members from WII who've been going and monitoring the same, uh, you know, the pack ice seals. So if, if you go back in history, the pack ice seals, uh, uh, particularly there is one particular seal known as the, uh, the southern uh, elephant seal, which was hunted almost to extinction because of oil and meat and things like that in the historic past prior to the 50s, you know. So all of these populations have now started to build back because there is a moratorium on hunting. No natural resource extraction is allowed in Antarctica. Okay, so there is an Antarctic Treaty and India is a member of that. And so whatever the activities that are carried out in, in Antarctica, it's primarily for scientific purpose. Okay, so any member of this Antarctic uh, uh, Treaty or this Antarctic group, have to have research programs ongoing. It's not just about going and establishing one, you know, uh, research station. So there's a lot of physical sciences work that has been going on. There's a lot of glacial science work that's going on, but there was very little work happening on wildlife in the sense like India, you know, we as an Indian research team. But otherwise, the Americans and the Australians are 50 years ahead of in terms of their understanding of Antarctic wildlife. So in, a, in and around the Indian uh, research station, we have been helping build that data and contributing this data for the larger platform of data that is being collected. So it was uh, such an unbelievable experience, I would say, you know, got to see so many species of whales. Every day was a, was a unique experience. You're seeing something new. But of course, it's extremely challenging. We were locked up. So right now it's locked down here, isn't it? Each of us are locked down. So it was almost similar. I was locked up in a ship. You know, because <laughs> we didn't have a station there. We have to stay in our cabin. And I was sharing my cabin with my colleague who was also there. So till then, we had never been on a tour together. So for the four months, we survived each other. <laughs> Uh, mentally stable and it was a uh, you know so I'm totally prepared for this current lockdown that is going on. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yeah, so yes, so it was a uh, it was a very very interesting uh, part of my life, uh, having to witness uh, sperm whales, humpback whales. All of these whales are very active at this point of time. Very close to my camp, uh, there was a there was a large colony of uh, emperor penguins that breed uh, in the uh, past eyes and uh, yes it was, it was simply un unbelievable i would definitely like to go back and relive it all once more yeah so this goes <laughs> back, goes back this story goes back 10 years back it was in 2009 10 expedition yeah, so it was uh, an extremely interesting piece of work and uh, there is also this uh, 
thing I'd like to share with you, uh, uh, Seema, uh, is that, you know, everywhere you go, the landscapes are all connected. We need to understand this. So while, when I was actually, you know, sailing in the uh, Antarctic Sea and in the Indian Ocean, the low pressure area, the, the ocean currents, everything has an India connect because our monsoon is born in that, in those waters, you know. So when I was sailing through and from the pilot, they were looking at the maps and saying that there's a cyclone that is forming here. It was so interesting to see each of these current systems are displacing one another and how this is now linked with the monsoon. And today when I talk about the Amor story, and that has the monsoon connect. So it seems like I have been connecting different landscapes, you know. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a very interesting uh, uh, story from that part of the world. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Suresh, just a uh, last question. Um, as a researcher with a leading government institute, what do you think is the role of citizen science initiative in conservation? Oh, to, to just put it straight, it's extremely important. Okay, it's extremely important because <clears throat> we are talking about climate change impacts. We have been talking about, strongly believe in all of this. Okay, there is a lot of people who dispute this and who you know, refute this whole thing, but I strongly believe all of this. But as a scientist, I would like to go with data. I would not just like to you know go with some popular stuff people saying that this antarctic ice melt or arctic ice melt all of these stories yes there are people working there and they have been documenting all of these stories but then if you want to talk about it very strongly you need to talk about it in terms of data how is flowering in Dehradun being affected by weather patterns some of the trees they're flowering very early on some of the years they're flowering very late could be cycles. The, the, the planet Earth has undergone these global warming and global cooling, all of these things. So there are definitely cyclical uh, you know, actions that's going on, but possibly we are accelerating it all. So now if I want to understand how natural systems function or work, to, if I want to know about uh, return migration of uh, uh, of a select species, okay? Now, sitting here in Dehradun, I simply cannot understand whether this particular bird that has arrived here, has it arrived this year on time or late? That individual variations can be there. But when you look at it as a population, as an entire species across its breeding range, I cannot go everywhere and collect that data. So it's extremely important for people, citizen scientists, to make these observations and report. So in fact, we have all been extensively using eBird data. eBird data does come with its own biases and issues, but eBird data is extremely uh, useful. And uh, uh, we do, we have indeed started seeing patterns in uh, this information. You might have heard about this report of India's, uh, you know, status of uh, state of India's bird report that was recently launched. It's entirely based on citizen science data, and so it's not just birds. It's about everything. There is also season watch, tree watch, uh, and uh, many other uh, things. It's about look, just anybody interested in uh, uh, nature making observations of butterflies and or just about anything. And we, are, this is just the start. Okay, I think uh, if I, I mean, it's, it's just the bird data that has been built up very nicely. The last two, two decades, there is a trend. But uh, this forms a very critical baseline. We don't have that data. I mean, how would you say decline without a baseline? But thankfully now with the citizen science data, we will be able to better understand population trends and, you know, or distributions or, you know, how these birds, uh, and seasons, or times, you know. So it's extremely important, extremely important, I would say. So uh, thank you, Suresh, for uh, yeah. honoring our request uh, and uh, sparing your valuable time to talk with us. I'm sure that uh, all that you have said uh, will be very valuable to our viewers and uh, will 
give them a new insight regarding the conservation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Seema, for giving me this opportunity. I just cannot connect with so many people and, and it's through your uh, medium that uh, I'm able to tell some of my stories. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and uh, all the best to the viewers. And please go and uh, uh, watch nature. It's such a beautiful thing that uh, sitting here from my window, I can see a lot of birds calling. It's so fascinating. I, I don't, I'm not really bothered about this lockdown. I'm actually enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, it's our pleasure and you're always welcome. Okay, uh, see you all uh, tomorrow in our next episode and don't forget to subscribe Fern's YouTube channel. Till then, stay home, stay safe. Goodbye and Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you.